This is uh, Jackson Brown's birthday, born this date, 1948. And one of my favorite Jackson Brown songs, The Pretender, here at 9.35. We welcome back our co-host, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, former Berkeley County Commission president as well. He's led many lives during this, his I'm trip around the forget, I'm sun. trying to hide from most of them. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you were particularly litigious during the Apple quiz, Bill. I thought uh, uh, pretty accurate. You can use another word, but I was, uh, yeah. But any time that you, you call me a bit being old, sometimes being old has its advantage. <laughs> I was there. I was there. <laughs> and uh, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap in studio as well. Johnny, good morning. Your deadline is now six days away. It is. Funny you should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> he mentions it all the I time. Hadn't, I hadn't. Is it really? I yeah. hadn't thought of it yeah. In, yeah. in like whole <laughs> minutes. Yeah, several times every show he mentions. <laughs> yeah, you don't have any writer's block or anything. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. But, but Mike Height dies today. Oh, he does. Oh, Mike Height dies. Today. Mike, Mike, it'll be good. He like it. He's listening. But, yeah, I, the show I thought you were going to make him the hero. That doesn't mean he, he does. Re- he lives. <laughs> Recurring. Okay, so even hero dies. Oh yeah. Not in the books that I read. So, well, yeah, some of them. Uh, I read the. Comic have you read books. all twenty? I think you have <laughs> I, not. I, I read Archie dies books. today. Yeah. <laughs> Archie dies. <today. laughs> yeah. And Veronica and Jughead too. Uh, Height paid. I think it was one hundred twelve thousand five hundred dollars at <laughs> that uh, at the hospice yeah, auction for plus, the right to be in a Gilstrap book and get killed. He didn't. He didn't really. <laughs> 36 cents. Yeah, it's a record-breaking uh, bid. It was wonderful. Very generous of Delegate Mike Height. In studio with Stanley D. Williams, uh, author of The Wizard Clip Haunting. And I have to say, uh, one of my favorite book covers ever. I've not had a chance to uh, read and finish the book uh, because it's football season. I'm a high school football coach. Uh, uh, Stan, if you didn't know that, but I'm, I have absolutely no life outside of that at this point. But uh, when I got this book shipped to me and I saw the cover, I'm like, oh, this is really an excellent cover. I'm not sure who did the artwork for you, but that's awesome. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much, Rob. Glad to be here. You brought along a silent passenger. We're, we're not going to put her on the spot, but I just want to say his <laughs> wife, Pam, is here, too. Yeah, she's keeping me straight. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the Wizard Clip Haunting, a true early American ghost story. The word true and ghost story always gets me when I see those together. Well, and the, and the word novel and true. <laughs> Kind of, I, I um, when I first put out the book cover for kind of like preview, kind of evaluation from some of my fans and stuff, uh, one lady wrote back and said, "It's a novel. It can't be true." And I said, "Well," and so I wrote a blog about what's true in history. And of course, any history is written by people that probably weren't there, they're, <laughs> except for Bill. Yeah, well, yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> or, or the or the victors are writing it, and so. Mm-hmm. But the, um, I, I came across the story. Actually, I'm, I'm a, more of a film producer and script consultant in Hollywood than I am a novelist or anything like that. I, this is my third book, but my first fictional book. And someone called me from Australia, of all places, in 2012 and said, uh, Dr. Williams, you need to write, you need, you need to make this movie. This would be a great film. And so I did some research, and I didn't have the money to make the movie, of course. Um, And so I wrote a screenplay, because that's one of my expertises, and shopped it around Hollywood a little bit, and got some interest from some of my friends. But I got really curious about one of the characters, Father Dennis Cahill. He's one of the guys that's involved in the exorcism at the end of the book. And there's nothing in history about what happened to him, his disposition. And I got really curious. So I made a couple trips, uh, research trips, one to New Orleans, another to Pittsburgh, and I came out here to Middleway and this whole area, Bartonsburg, for about 10 days, stayed at Priestfield Pastoral Center, and I started talking to historians and visiting archivists, and I spent some time in the Baltimore archives at St. Mary's Seminary, where all the Catholic history is. It goes back hundreds of years. And what I, I found out what happened to Father Dennis Cahill, but actually not at the seminary. I was walking out of the archives, and Teresa Pine, the archivist, who's still the archivist there, said, well, Dr. Williams, did you find out what you were looking for? And I said, no. She says, that's really interesting. There was a, a, an elderly lady here, a historian and a journalist that worked for, that worked for the journal here in town. And um, she said, I think she was looking for what happened to Dennis Cahill, too. And I said, really? And so it was, her name was Edith Darrow, and it was a unique spelling. And I went out to my van, and I typed in Edith Darrow into my my phone search engine, and up came her name with a phone number. And I dialed it, and that night I took out this elderly historian to to, to dinner, 
and I found out what happened to Dennis Cahill. And she said, and you can confirm this, she says, go to the historic Martins, uh, Martinsburg uh, Courthouse, you know, downtown, mm-hmm. um, tomorrow morning and check this out. So I did, and I found out what, what happened to him. It's just really amazing. And when I, when I find out, I said, well, this is not a movie. This is a book, and it's a long book. And I'm sorry, but I can't tell you, Rob, because you'll have to read the book and find out. <laughs> I, promise, I promise I will. <laughs> but um, that was the beginning. So uh, on the way back to Michigan, um, driving back, I, I started plotting this thing out. And it took me, took me eight more years to plot it out and write it and do the, because I did a lot of research, a lot of his, historical research. I'm not a historian, naturally. Um, and uh, so that's so, – so actually, so the story – you asked, and I didn't answer your question yet. The story is about the well-documented haunted house events in Middleway, West Virginia, which at the time was Smithfield, Virginia. And there's probably, there's lots of haunted house stories around the country, but this one has probably got more documentation about it than anything else. And in fact, John Carroll, the first bishop of the United States, sent um Reverend Demetrius Augustine Gallitzin, you know, the priest from Loretto, Pennsylvania, down to investigate it. And uh, Gallitzin wrote about it, wrote extensively about it. And there was, there's a number of other, you, you go online and you just type in wizard clip on the internet and you'll get a hundred hits, mm-hmm. all kinds of documentation. So I started collecting the stories. And, um, and, one, of the, and one of the things I, I found was that Gallitzin actually wrote about this at some length for the bishop and for his superiors. And it got passed around like a good book, never returned. And so it was lost to history. So I sort of culturally appropriated him. And so he's the narrator of the book. Very and, nice. Uh, so I'm going to spend next Monday, a week from today, I'll, I'll be spending the whole day in Loretto, Pennsylvania as a guest of St. Francis University giving talks in their classrooms and a public lecture that night about it because Glitzen is very significant. So anyhow, it's, it's a well-documented story, and there's all these facts. So there's probably a hundred really well-known facts about it, but how they're all tied together and how it – and, and there, there's no cogent story mm-hmm. written about it. So that's the novel fills that gap. And what's the main era we're dis- we're talking time wise? We're talking 1790. Um, the the story it, it's 17 essentially 1788 to 1797. That's the era. Just just after the and most of the action takes place after the uh, Revolutionary War and after the United States was founded and before the turn of the century. Now you and Mr. Gilstrap have screenplays, Hollywood, and books in common. So I'm going to go to him for the first question. So, <clears throat> what are what are some of the well-known facts? To give me a, a, a little bit about what the story is, the haunting, and actually, haunting and Catholicism aren't necessarily on the on the same spectrum. Plane. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Yeah, so there's a little irony there. Well, the, one of the facts is that. Adam Livingston is a real person. His land, he had 350 acres in Middleway, what is today Middleway, Virginia. And uh, the deed is there. And when he, and one of the, one of the most, one of the things that really drew me to the story and that kind of ties the haunting to uh, Catholicism is that he tried for years to get rid of this poltergeist activity that was haunting his farm. And people were coming from all over the place just out of curiosity. What was the stories. nature of the poltergeist activity? Well, um, the, the, the most there were, the, there were things like noises and carriages. In the middle of the night, it sounded like uh, an, um, horses um, running around the house with carriages. Uh, there would be fire that would fly out of the fireplace in, in the gathering hall. Um, one time, there, there's a couple reports of rocks being lodged, dislodged from the fireplace and flying at p- visitors that were in the house. But the most unique thing, and where the word clip comes from, the wizard clip, well, the name wizard was a nickname given to by the curiosity seekers. But the clip came from the, probably the most predominant uh, evidence of the haunting was that they would open a drawer, take out a piece of linen, and it was clipped into crescent moons. Crescent moons were clipped out of the cloth. And so just by the end of two or three years, almost every piece of cloth, probably every piece of cloth in the house and even in the barn were clipped into shreds, into crescent moon threads. Um, and so that's where the clip name came from. And some of the... Yeah, scissors. They scissors. They so you hear the sound of so the sound of the clipping scissors 
that's where. So if you go to uh, Middleway today, you'll see on the uh, fronts of many of the buildings, there are wooden badges. And the badges have a picture of a pair of scissors, uh, a crescent moon, and then a little magician in a top hat that stands in for the wizard. So anyhow, there was an exorcism. He starts asking ministers to come. They can't do anything. For the, for the house. For the house, yeah. yeah. There's no possession. There's no uh, human possession of, of a demon or anything like that. But the house and the barn and all that. The barn is destroyed, by the way. Um, crops uh, are destroyed. There's, there's a number of kind of gross things that happen in history that um, are, are really interesting. But then, so they, they bring ministers. Ministers can't do anything. And so finally he has his nightmare. And the nightmare is something he can't understand. And he goes, and he's sent down the street to the McSherry's, which lived in Lee Town. Real people, Richard and Anastasia McSherry. And the McSherry say, well, that sounds like the Catholic Mass. And so they take him to meet their priest, who's a circuit-riding priest, that comes to Shepherdsville uh, at, uh, and Father Dennis Cahill. That's Father Dennis Cahill. He starts the church, St. Agnes, which is there today. And I'm speaking at St. Agnes on I think Wednesday at noon. But, um, and there's an exorcism. So what happens at the end of all this, when the exorcism takes place and the house is cured of its hauntings, Livingston retires and donates 35 acres of his land, which is 10% of the property that he owned, to the Catholic Church for the keeping of a priest. That land today is Priest Field Pastoral Center in Middleway. And it's, it's a large retreat center that's still very active. So that's the connection between the hauntings and the Catholic Church. Uh, Doctor, I'm reading Google as you talk, yeah. and I've never heard of uh, this incident before, uh, before you appearing this morning. But I see a sentence here that I think ties together a lot of what you said. Ultimately, the stranger died of his illness, and there were no Catholic priests to be found. He was buried nearby without the benefit of a Catholic service. Right, yeah. So so that's actually the uh, turning point in the story mm-hmm. where a stranger comes to stay at the Livingston's house. He's a sojourner, you know, and, there aren't, and the inn was full in Smithfield. And so he, he asked this farmer, can I stay with you? Mm-hmm. And he stays, they have dinner, they, he stays, and he goes to sleep that night, and in the middle of the night he dies. But before he dies, he's, he's asking the Livingston's to uh, find a priest so he can have last rites, confession of last rites. But the Livingstons, much like the time, were very anti-cleric, anti-Catholic. There's a lot of, from the, the old penal laws that started with Henry VIII that carried down throughout the colonies in the early United States, and the Guy Fawkes bonfires where they burned the Pope in effigy. So the Livingstons refused to have a priest cross the threshold of their house. And he dies, and before he dies, the stranger in my novel curses the Livingstons, and that's when the hauntings begin. See. Now, you mentioned there's a lot of facts here. Uh, is it more difficult to write a novel where there are few facts or where there are a lot of facts? Well, I suppose that's where how, how vivid your imagination yeah, is. Yeah. Um, I particularly love history, and so for me this was – it was, it was easy in one respect because it was exciting because there were all these facts. And, in fact, the book – Throughout the book, there's little asterisks, and the asterisks indicate that what immediately follows is a documented fact, and sometimes you don't know how much past the asterisks is a fact or not, but nonetheless, I, I try to kind of tie it th- to those things. But so I, it, it took me years to figure out how to, because I wanted to take all the facts that were pretty well known, and I wanted to tell them in a cogent manner. So how are they related? What's the backstory? How, how does this fit? You know, if this is true, how does this fit? And there's a re- there was a reasonable explanation. I kept working at it and doing more research and finding out more stuff. And little by little, the, the plot and the, and the flow of the story takes place. So I like having more facts, Bill. Uh, but some people, I think, but I've, I've written stories where there are no facts. Yeah. And, and that's interesting, too. But you still have to tie it to reality. Yeah. You still have to do a lot of research for the realm, the country, the place, the time, the people, so that it makes sense. And yeah. so... Let me put this in context. You yeah. say you've written two other books besides yeah. this one. They were nonfiction. Uh, right. What were they? Uh, one was a, a memoir, just a memoir thing. And the other one is my, the book that kind of made me modestly uh, popular in Hollywood, and that's this book here, The Moral Premise. I don't know. Um, 
There you go. The, mor- the Moral Premise, Harnessing Virtue and Vice for Box Office Success is a story structure book that's used throughout Hollywood for helping write screenplays and, and connecting with audiences. And it's nothing I invented, but it goes back, it reaches back to the Greeks and the early novel writings and, 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 and plays and stuff like that. And it ties together the concept of the moral premise. So for a story to be, the essence of it is for a, any story in any medium to be popular and connect with audiences, it has to agree with natural law. The virtue and vice elements have to agree with natural law. If it does, there's a chance that it can be popular if everything else works. If it's if it's not, if it disagrees with natural law, it will be a failure at the box office, guaranteed. Now, I noticed the I think I saw on the cover is a lady eating an apple. Yeah. Fits in with that, the theme. Bill. That fits in with the today's <laughs> theme. Apple. <laughs> 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 okay. Now you live you live in Hollywood today? No, I, I I've gone out there quite a bit, okay. and uh, uh, but I live in uh, Southeast Michigan. Okay. And so most of my work, even recently, especially with the internet coming up, and, uh, I've been able. People send me scripts with PDFs, sure. and we yeah. get on Zoom and mm-hmm. do conferences yeah. and stuff. So when you're doing your research and wandering around Lee Town, <clears throat> were people aware? Of this, was is it part of the zeitgeist still with oh, that, yeah. that part? Oh yeah, well, like I said, if you go to, in fact, uh, this coming Saturday, I will be at the Middle Way Fair, and the Middle Way Day Fair is kind of celebrates the whole concept of the Wizard Clip. So if you drive through Middle Way today on Queen Street, you'll see uh, triangular wooden badges on the fronts, and there's a there's a pair of scissors. There's the wizard clip with the top hat, and then there's a crescent moon. That's all about the wizard clip. And, in fact, there's a, a historical marker in the middle of town about it. And those, the houses with, with these medallions on them, are yeah. they, is it commemorative, or were they somehow involved with? I don't know that they were involved. I think it's more commemorative. The, ho- the homes that have the badges on them are quite old. I don't know how old. I know the, the one house that I've been into, the, uh, the what is the Daniel Fry house, um, that has a badge on it, and that's at least as old as the late 1700s. And what is on the site of the house that is featured here? They, this is the interesting thing, John. No one knows where the property was. I have a copy of the deed. I gave the copy of uh, Adam Livingston's deed to um, a guy that's on the American Historical Surveys, Surveyors Organization. He's on the board of directors. He lives in Charlestown. He could not figure it out. So there, we know that there were originally three plots of lands. We know that part of the land was where the Priestfield Pastoral mm-hmm. Center is today. And we know that it reached back to Turkey Run Creek. But no one knows where the house is. It was torn down. Um, I, I would love to have enough money to take some, do some ground. Do we know radar. what the demise was? Did it burn? Was it torn down? Did no, it? Don't, know, don't know the demise. You mentioned the lady from the journal, Edith, Edith Dorrell. Yeah. Uh, what was her her interest in this particular story? Well, she's she was a, a Vatican journalist for a while, so she was interested in all things Catholic. Although mm-hmm. she didn't, she wrote about all sorts of stuff yeah. for the journal. Um, so she was she lived in Rome for a number of years and wrote stuff like that. So her connection was Catholic. So this is obviously a Catholic story to a great yeah. extent. And so that she was interested in the priests and stuff. Now, well, Galitzin, uh, Father Galitzin, who's well known, he's he's on his path to sainthood. He's a servant of God. Uh, in fact, I had a privilege of knowing and speaking with uh, his postulator for some time, Betty uh, Seymour, who lives in Loretto. But no one knew much about Dennis Cahill. He shows up in America as a and, and starts six churches But no one knows where he came from, and no one knows where he went. Although there is a footnote that I found in the archives that in 1812 he went back to Ireland. But I don't think that's true, and I have physical evidence that it's not true, and you'll have to read the book to find out. On on Wednesday, uh, one of the co-hosts is a former editor of the journal, also a Catholic. So uh, Maria Lawrence and I suspect the subject will come up on Wednesday as well. Could so, be. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the existing city editor uh, has a copy of the book, and I don't know if she's written about it yeah. yet. Right. Yeah. And I've been advertising their journal. Sure. Uh, just a technical note, Maria is not back yet this oh, Wednesday. Oh, she's not. She's still in Spain. Right. So uh, the guest, by the way, today is Dr. Stanley D. Williams, author of The Wizard Clip Hunting. A true early American ghost story set in uh, Middleway, West Virginia, not far from here uh, at all, in fact. 
and uh, you speculated early on that you thought this might be a movie. Then you said, wait a second, this is a book. And as you pointed out, it's a, it's a big book. Uh, lots to write about in here. But do you think it still will be a movie someday? Well, um, there, there's an adage in Hollywood that says, if you can't get the movie make, made, write the book first. So I've written the book. Now we've got to sell a million copies. Then we have an audience. You, you will not like the adaptation of a book that big. No, not unless I write the screenplay. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, what brings you to the area today? Is it, is it the celebration in Middleway? Yeah, yeah. The, the reason I came this, so the book tour, I'm here for 10 days doing libraries and churches and a bookstore. I was at Shepherdstown Four Seasons Bookstore on Saturday. And it was, and the reason for that was the Middle Way Day Festival, because I knew that that had to be a, a, a keystone of, of the book, book's promotion. So that's why we're here this, at this time. Yeah, when is the Middle Way Day Festival? It's October 14th, Saturday, from, three, uh, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. along East Street in Middle Way. Very good. I've, I've never been working in this area for 33 years. I've never heard of the Middle Way Day Festival. Nor have I. That's, that's interesting, yeah. Well, yeah. it's October 14th this year. I don't know how many years it's been going on. I know it's been going on a few, but not. It took a person from Michigan to tell me about a festival just down the street. Bill. That, well, well, someone well, that's written a fascinating book that I'm anxious to read. So. Well, right. Rob, the, this story was told to me by a Filipino who immigrated to Australia who <laughs> called me on the phone. So there you go. That started it's like a George Thorogood song. I met a German girl in England who was going to school in France, right? Hey, 957 back with a final minute with Dr. Stanley D. Williams after this.